This Let's Play was supported by these awesome hobby companies. Hello everybody and welcome to Let's Play. And this week we are joined by the folks uh, from Cubicle 7. So I'm joined by Dave and Zach. And we're going to be exploring the wonderful world of Doctor Who. But this is a upcoming version for 5e. So uh, Zach, great to have you with us once again. And I understand you're going to be our games master for our wanderings through time and space. I'm going to do my best to corral you. Um, I know what it's like to give a group like this a TARDIS, uh, <laughs> um, but I'm very excited to see what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, this is the upcoming uh, Doctors and Daleks, which is kind of a, a bit of a combination between the Doctor Who role-playing game and uh, uses the fifth edition basic rules mm -hmm. um, and a load of like new mechanics and new little twists and things. Uh, it should be really, really fun. Okay, so it should be easy enough for people to follow along if they know 5th edition. Um, and then anything that's un unusual or surreal, uh, you can <laughs> chime in and let us know exactly what we should be doing. Uh, generally yeah. with the phrase, put that sonic screwdriver down and move away from the console. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to start with time travel uh, whenever we start running. So um, we expect uh, quite a few new mechanics and new little twists. But yeah, it should be fully familiar to anyone who's played any 5 e We've tried to make it as easy as possible to get into. Okay. Um, so my companions on this journey then, uh, Ben, you are going to be playing... Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be playing as Bill Potts, who a lot of people will remember uh, from the Peter, Peter Capaldi uh, Doctor era, so the 12th Doctor. So I'll be playing as her, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, She is the, the stalwart within the, uh, the group, the student. So yeah. Excellent. And Dave, you are? Uh, I'm playing uh, Graham, uh, who is companion to the 13th Doctor, um, played by the awesome Bradley Walsh, um, who is a uh, an empath, um, technically the elder, because um, I figured, you know, grumpy middle-aged northern man, that's just me. <laughs> and I'm playing Perfect. the 4th Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only one prepared with props so, under background. Yeah, true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it also gives me an excuse to snack <laughs> throughout the entire game, which is always good. And, you know, if I hold the life of an entire civilization in my hands, we'll answer deep philosophical questions like, do I have the right? But uh, without further ado, uh, it's over to Zach. And you can get us into time and space. Yeah, I was going to say, I wasn't sure which season of The Fourth Doctor to put in. I think I've forgotten to put the effects for the incredibly long scarf on the character sheet. But um, <laughs> well, I think we'll be okay without that. Uh, so um, what's actually happening is The Fourth Doctor, during uh, his travels through time, um, has detected that there will be some sort of uh, multiplicative phase fluctuation threshold that will be reached in a, a particular area on a planet uh, in the time stream and doesn't really understand much more than that because those were a lot of words very quickly and it's time to get there. But unfortunately, um, the Fourth Doctor's companions weren't available at this uh, point in the time stream. So he's kind of uh, gone all over the place and picked up a few people that he knows his future self trusts so might as well bring them along for the ride and see if they can uh, solve this problem. So after picking them both up, um, we will start off with the time travel rules and you will all be working together to pilot the TARDIS to the destination that the TARDIS has kind of decided on itself. Um, so there are three things that you'll uh, need to be doing for this because obviously the TARDIS supposed to be piloted by six people mm. you've managed to get three that's pretty good you're halfway there that's much better than normal that's true um so one of you will be plotting a course one of you will be navigating the vortex and one of you will be making sure you stick the landing um and they're all going to require so the first one to plot the course is an intelligence navigators tools check mm -hmm. the second uh, to navigate the vortex is a dexterity temporal vehicles check and stick the landing is also a dexterity temporal vehicles check. Um, if you don't have those skills, don't worry. You can still make an attempt. And uh, just a reminder for the doctor, 
Mm. Because you are a time lord, you are vortex sensitive, and you will have advantage on any of these rolls if you want to. Well, obviously, nobody gets to crash the TARDIS except me. So uh, I think I'm going to be plotting the course because I don't want people to accidentally drop us into something unpleasant in the middle of nowhere. It takes an awful lot of getting out, and you can't regenerate. And I don't want that on my conscience. <laughs> but uh, Bill, if you could, uh, if you could make sure that we uh, stick the landing, so to speak. I am on it. Yes, I'll do and, that. Uh, yeah. Graham, if you pick up the slack, let me know if you need any help. Canines in the corner; he can support you. Well, I've been driving a bus for years. I, surely this can't be that different. Although I'm used to it being sort of more amber and crystalline than this, but you know, I'm sure it'll be fine. Oh, no, we're, we're svelte. We're, we don't need any of that frippery. Believe me, that this has got me around there and back again uh, on many <laughs> occasions, so you don't need to worry about all of the fancy doodads and glowing bits that uh, my future self may or may not want to add. It's terrible, <laughs> really. Good enough for years. Oh, very okay. good, Doctor. So it is a DC-14 Intelligence Navigators tools check that you can mm -hmm. make with advantage. Uh, 16... Very good. All right, then. And that means that the next check is made with uh, advantage because you did so well. So um, who's navigating? It's going to be Graham, yes? Graham. Mm -hmm. Graham's going to so be navigating. Give me a DC 15 dexterity temporal vehicles check. Oh, I like I have temporal vehicles. I'll give you a, I'll give you a plus one for bus driving, I think. Oh, that's, that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't have much dexterity either but oh no but it is an ad on advantage isn't it so I, it's the best of best of two uh oh that's a definite fail still oh, uh, yeah failure. yeah oh, right then i just was just roll, i'll roll on the table to see what happens uh, so oh uh, time lightning the ship is struck several times by lightning from the storms of the vortex everyone in the time machine must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw. Oh, for 1d4 lightning damage. Uh oh, oh go ahead. Oh. What, was the DC, what was the DC on that one again, Zach? It's 15. 15. Shall oh, I roll I got, damage? I got 11. So. Or do you want me to roll? <laughs> um, you can roll your own. Oh, it's yeah. very decent of you. Will I get the maximum? Yes, I will get the maximum. Oh, no. <laughs> It's like a little pyramid of evil. Thank you, Graham. Pick myself up, dust myself down, throw my <laughs> scarf back around my shoulder. I'm Could sorry. you try and avoid that next time? <laughs> Luckily, I, I rolled a natural 20, so I'm, I'm, I, I seem to be fine with, <laughs> and don't get... <laughs> Clearly, you've crashed more than one bus in your time. You know what you're doing. Meanwhile, Bill rolled, a, rolled, a, rolled an 11, so went, she, she's unfortunately getting hit by this. What was the damage from this? Sorry, was Just 1d4. Just 1d4. 1d4. Just. Oof, three. Oh. I feel your pain. <laughs> I don't so the lightning kind of rocks around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the TARDIS actually, um, it was rocking around a lot before this, and there was actually a, a one moment of calm as you heard kind of cracking <laughs> thunder go through it. But that was even more of something that threw you off yeah. and caused you to kind of bash your heads. And then, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what I touched. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, I'll, I'll go and sit in the corner. <laughs> No, oh, I'll, I'll pull myself up to the console to take a look to see what exactly Graham's done to my beloved ship. Ship seems <sighs> fine. Ship seems fine, but it's down to Bill now to uh, make the DC-15 Dexterity Temporal Vehicles check. Okay, here we go. It can't go worse than before. <laughs> uh, can I use... Are any mobilities helpful? Not quite yet. Let's just go with the solo. Was it DC 14, was it, yeah? DC 15. 15. Oh, yes. Uh, so that was a 17. It's all good. Yeah. 17. Fantastic. Yeah. So this means that I get to roll the maximum number of dice in the table, so hopefully you still get a great result. Um, I, could you, uh, does anyone have 2d6 on hand? Because I rolled snake eyes, and I feel like it's unfair if the GM rolls the worst <laughs> possible result on the table. <laughs> Someone doing well. Uh, five. Is that any worse? 
five, five is actually very good. So five, you've had a, a bit of a bumpy ride, as you might expect from mm. the previous navigating the vo- vortex uh, situation. Um, but with a, a bit of the doctor's guidance, you all managed to brace yourself in time. Um, and the tire, uh, and you uh, hear a quite a loud crunching sound. Um, Graham, you're actually quite familiar with it as like a gear stick crunching. <laughs> but more timey-wimey. Um, <laughs> so, so this might be a bit broken, but otherwise, you've all landed and you're all fine and healthy, other than a little bit shook up. And uh, yeah, the TARDIS panels are flashing that like the multiplicative phase fluctuation threshold is uh, going to be imminently reached unless the Doctor either does something or doesn't intervene. It's quite hard to tell but they uh, advise you to get out of there because the atmosphere is breathable and uh, you've got work to do. I find these things generally sort themselves out. I walk over to my little hat rack, take my pork pie hat, drop it on my head, cross my massive curls and walk to the door and open it very gingerly, just peering out. Uh, Bill's going to s- s- sort her jacket and then run up behind the doctor and just poke her head out straight away. She's brave and confident, so she's going to sneak around and have a look and see what's outside. So, yeah. All, All right. Mm. You two see a, a, a forest. It looks uh, quite tropical. Um, it's very warm, quite muggy. There's quite a lot of uh, moisture in the air. Um, huge amount of plant life. And it just seems very kind of uh, foresty and nice. Uh, both of you can make me a um, either an intelligence science or history check. To kind of see, try to learn some more about your environment. See if you can place it in time mm-hmm. or like where these plants have come from, what kind they are. Uh, got a crit. So in total, oh, that is uh, 24. Um, mm, so, show yeah. off. 15. <laughs> 15 on my history. Uh, so, Doctor, you actually notice... The, um, the trees uh, that are around you mm. seem to look like they're from the Holocene era of uh, prehistoric Earth. Oh, delightful. I've not been here in, well, I won't be here for the years. <laughs> um, but as you kind of wander around and say to everyone, oh, yes, one day I will be in prehistoric Earth in the Holocene era. Um, Bill, you notice that the Doctor is actually slightly incorrect on this one? Uh, it's a rare opportunity to correct the doctor, but um, there are several nearby plants from the late Cretaceous period. And uh, looking at both of them closely and using your kind of vast academic knowledge as well that you've been gaining during your tutelage with a different doctor, um, there's no way that these plants could be in the same place at the same time. There's got to be some kind of genetic modification on all of these plants to thrive in this particular environment uh bill just stares open mouth and just goes this is weird and then re- calls back to graham is like come on there might be dinosaurs <laughs> sorry, sorry i was just getting my tea i was just putting it in a flask hang on uh, okay the tea dinosaurs graham <laughs> what, what, we're, it's just epping isn't it we're back in epping <laughs> contain your excitement <laughs> pop my hands in my pockets and go for a gentle saunter into the wilderness. It oh, was, right. it was do, do, do we lock this? Very much as this that I met Layla. Do you know her? <laughs> Wonderful girl, charming. Doesn't say much. It's what I like in a companion. You should try it. <laughs> so as you saunter after Bill and uh, Graham kind of comes up behind you with his tea, uh, Bill, you find that the forest kind of suddenly ends and it seems to be bounded by what looks like a metal curb um, with a walkway separating it from um, another curb and like a cloudy pool of water with a tank about five feet deep um, with this cloudy water and a control panel next to it. And um, as you continue to look around, and this is very much due to rolling a crit and just being generally observant, um, uh, in fact, actually it would be Graham that notices this because he has the highest passive perception. Uh, you see as you come up behind Bill that um, you're actually in some kind of dome made up of hexagonal shapes that you can just see uh, the edges of above you and kind of through the trees. Um, 
So there's this weird tank in front of you, and there's actually the edge of the dome. You can go and inspect either of those if you like. See, I told you it weren't anywhere strange. It's just an Eden project, isn't it? Well, it looks a lot like it, yeah. Uh, now, remind me, Doctor, do we touch stuff here or do we not touch stuff? <laughs> As Bill's, like, reaching out to touch something. <laughs> I find it's generally best that you don't touch things until you okay. know the things will touch you back. <laughs> Think of this as like a school trip. Hands in your pockets. Follow along. Oh, exactly Single file that. behind me. <laughs> yeah. I uh, give a gentle toe nudge to one of the sort of metal curbs, just to, as if it's like, oh, what's that? That looks familiar. And start following it off towards what I perceive to be the closest wall. Yeah, you get to a wall quite quickly, and there is definitely something as you stub your toe on this thing. There's um, a little bit of an air of familiarity about this place, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Um, you get to the nearest wall of this dome, and you see that there is a vast desert outside, no plant life whatsoever, kind of very orangey-ready uh, environment, and you note that there are two suns up in the air. Um... And just as you wait for this, you kind of, uh, because you're not the, let's see, uh, yeah, not the most observant, unfortunately. Um, a, uh, you're kind of transfixed by these suns in the desert and thinking about like the technology, and how nice it is that there's this kind of um, paradise-like environment. And then a 10-foot uh, tall dinosaur slams up against the side of the dome and starts scratching at it, <laughs> trying to, uh, get to you and it's quite frightening but um doesn't seem to make a dent um and you notice that these two strange floating orbs resembling sea urchins kind of float along behind it and shift colors from like a deep turquoise to a red and shoot like laser beams at this giant raptor type thing until it goes away oh my god the fence system keeping the riffraff and scavengers away i approve they have one of those at your Eden project, Graham? Um, I, only for the younger kids. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, clearly this has been uh, put here for a reason. Looking at the twin sons and the, uh, I suppose, habitat that we're in, assuming it's not some sort of unusual zoo, do I have any clue what this could be? Hmm. Uh, I would say make me a DC 13 intelligence science check. It's possible. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, Very you see them on like tattooing all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go and find the inhabitants of this delightful place. Uh, just pick a direction and with all the confidence yeah. of somebody who knows exactly where they're going, walk straight into the middle of the jungle. Keep up. Grant, absolutely. Um, as right you behind start the doctor, walking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. As you start walking in what might be uh, some form of pathetic fantasy, the sprinklers turn on and it starts to get quite wet in here. Um, and you see uh, just in the distance, kind of through some of the trees, what looks to be a human wearing a uh, tunic and sandals. Uh, seems to be working the plants, picking some, examining some of the others, doing a little bit of clipping. Gardener. That's good. I, I shall heal this stout fellow. Hello. We seem to have got a tiny bit lost. We were looking for the control panel. Can you help us? And um, the rises and you can see that he's about six foot four as you said stout he's broadly built and seems to be very muscular um with like a high forehead quite a handsome kind of um aquiline like ancient style handsome face mm -hmm. um but incredibly more looking and he says oh hello um what sorry what did you say uh, the control panel, the, the control room. We, we need to get to it. I've been sent to fix it. There's an issue. It's nothing to worry about. You can go back to your plants when you show me where it is. Everyone oh. upstairs knows all about it. Don't worry. Control, Jenny, control. 
What? What is that? Never mind. Um, really? Yes. Quite delicious. <laughs> I, I I should stick to the the mandated supplies. Um, yes, of of course. The command room, the main dome in the promenade is over that way. I'll take you over and open the doors. And oh, that's kind of... terrific. Isn't that terrific, Bill? Graham, isn't this a wonderful thing? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh... <laughs> we'll definitely recommend you to your superiors. I'm too happy. <laughs> Maybe there'll be accommodation in it for you. Hmm? Well, I'm quite happy where I am as long as they let me stick around for my due time, you know? It's, it's uh, fantastic to hear. Have you been here long? Happy in your work, you seem to be. Um, well, yes, everyone was born here and lives here. We, are, you, are you not from here? Oh, of course. Just from a little way over there. Not from right here, where you're standing with this leaf. That would uh, be insane. Uh, You'd have noticed it before now. That's a good and strange and confusing point. Certainly distracting. Um, you are all well. You particularly, any points of Ukraine. You look very strange and unusual. Are you sure you're from around here? Like your clothes are all weird, and your face is kind of scrunchy. Well, that's one way of putting it. I'm not heard it. Girls, black, black, black. What's wrong with my face? Nothing. It's, it's just the only different. one he's got. <laughs> it's a fair point <laughs> anyway you're going to take us to the control room yes well look I, I'm not permitted to go there I still have to do my daily activities but I'll let oh. you into the promenade and you'll be able to you'll see it it's right at the top of the door splendid isn't that splendid splendid thank you very much for your time I'd watch out for that one it looks like it has a little bit of aphid on it we should probably deal with that you don't want them getting out of hand they can be a complete blighter Oh, I'll I'll bring that up. Yes, thank you. This is incredible news. Um, perhaps they'd be good for eating. Maybe. Well, you can't beat a good jelly baby, but you know, if your push comes to shove, why not try an effort or three? They're very slimming. Hmm. I'll 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 make sure to let the agricultural team know. They'll be thrilled, thrilled. Thank you so much. Fantastic. As we go, to, as as we go to leave, Bill sort of like turns around to the the gentleman and just says, "By the way, mate, what's your name?" Oh, my name's Tarek. Tarek, nice to meet you. I'm Bill. Nice to meet you, Bill. Um, yes. And uh, it leads you to a um, just to the edge of the dome where it kind of connects to another through a little tube into the, a much larger dome that you can't really see the inside of because of the reflections from the two suns. Mm -hmm. um, but you're led into this huge dome, um, which seems to be the main center of this place. Uh, it's lined with like large primeval trees everywhere. They're practically bl blanketing the roof, except for an inverted dome at the top of the dome, which you can see there is stairs leading up to. Um, which Tarek points out as the control room. Um, but the stairs look like a weird bit of the architecture. They don't seem to match up with anything else. There's loads of like really beautiful buildings, all uh, quite simple and minimalist and stone, like you'd maybe see on uh, some of the ancient civilizations of Earth. But um, there's lots of stairs that are kind of uh, weird heights and going to weird places um, for entrances to houses and things like that. Um, yeah, loads of windows and doors that are seemingly at random heights. But um, you are in the middle of like this big thoroughfare. There's like markets everywhere. Um, there's restaurants serving what looks to be like prehistoric meat, like uh, Apatosaurus burgers, Camelops kebabs. Uh, beardfish sushi, steamed horseshoe crabs, longhorn bison milk, all sorts of strange things. Um, as well as like a, quite a few clothiers, uh, clothiers, sorry, tailors, uh, people selling like very simplistic robes. There's like one or two toy makers that you can see as you're wandering around and some hair salons. 
Um, but that seems to be about it. There's potted plants everywhere. Again, the environment's quite muggy, quite moist. But uh, loads and loads of people that all look relatively similar to Tarak. Um, all quite tall and muscular and fit. Um, yeah, what would you like to do? I'm going to wring out the ends of my scarf after getting that little soaking from the sprinkler system. <laughs> Just in the doorway to where we are. Oh, this is unusual. Do the people around us look like they are, how should we say this politely, in a soporific state like Tarek was? Are they just kind of going through the motions or or is he just, he, he reached his peak when he was given pruning jobs in the habitat and he was never going to get a bit more involved in that? Um, generally, everyone seems pretty happy. Um, very few people who, in fact, no one seems as sad as Tarek, uh, and everyone seems to generally be quite happy going about their work, as he seemed to be. Seemed like maybe there was something else that was bothering him. But uh, yeah, in general, everyone seems quite happy. Um, there seems to be a big emphasis on work here. Um, you could make a uh, insight check to kind of get a read on everyone around here. Mm -hmm. or perception to kind of see if you can see more about them. I'll go for perception because I actually have a bonus in that. Oh. Uh, 17. Oh, very, very nice. Mm. Uh, yeah, and with kind of your knowledge of um, history and familiarity with uh, humanoids in general, um, you know, as you kind of put things together that like, okay, so ancient earth styles, that's kind of weird, but they um, are all tall, physically fit, very beautiful, and they're all adults kind of in the prime of their lives. Mm. No children, no teenagers even, and no old people. Um, and everyone seems to be at the like the peak of their health. Mm -hmm. um, they all seem to be polite with each other, and they might not be like a hundred percent human. Maybe like an offshoot of humanity. Bill uh, uh, nudges Graham and just says, "It's like being on a weird love island or something." <laughs> <laughs> what's what's a love island? Oh, you know, it's that reality show, you know, where all those really nice, handsome people are all together and then they, you know, but, you know, there's always something weird. I get that feeling about this place too, but, uh, yeah. I, I was more worried about the Logan's Run vibes. I'm just waiting for them to start, start hunting me. Logan's okay. Run and Bill, I'm... like, scratches the chest. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, they'll probably remake it someday soon, Bill. You'll be able to find out then <laughs> when Ryan Reynolds is in charge. <laughs> we should make we should make speed. We we don't know why we're here yet, and uh, I don't want things to creep up on us. Um, I do think we should get to whatever passes for control room here. People just seem to be going about their lives. It would be interesting to see what's running this, because mm. with the exception of. Uh, I suppose the shopkeepers and the um, gardener we've met, there's nobody else really looking like they're in a position of authority or the, you know, we're not seeing things like police or guards or technicians. It's just people in togas. Let's, let's push on for where he said the uh, command Ooh. pod was. Yeah. Try and uh, blend in, I say, as I take the lead looking flamboyantly dramatic and like I own the place as I stroll through the middle. Uh, as a time traveller, um, this is one of your background features, actually. You can, it's on the second sheet of your character sheet, I think. You can, you actually have the ability to blend in kind of wherever you are. Oh. So that's quite fitting. Uh, that, that makes sense. Sometimes if you draw enough attention to yourself, it's as though you're not there at all. <laughs> uh, I'll need that later on. So, um, as you're kind of walking through the promenade, trying to find the way up to these stairs that lead up to this huge dome, um, 
you can see two men walking their way uh, across the floor. Um, and this, you know, it's doctor because the first person that you see who is injured or unwell, um, and it does actually seem to be someone who's a little bit older as well. You can see someone um, using crutches and it looks like he's got quite a badly broken leg and a, uh, a younger man is kind of helping him to walk along, but both of them seem to be quite upset. Um, and as you see this little scene, you see two of the kind of glowing urchin-like drone things that you saw earlier, still in a, like a, a turquoise now, um, kind of float up next to them and in kind of a, a soothing tone and light up as this voice comes out of them. Attention, Shezrin, labourer. You are now officially redundant. It is my honour to escort you to Farewell Facility 3 for your life celebration and recycling. Please follow me and make your requests for anyone you wish to attend your celebration. Um, and as uh, the kind of strange sea urchin relays this, you can see both of the, the men, the older one and the younger one supporting him, kind of openly sob. And um, the passers-by kind of sympathetically shake their heads. Um, but yeah, that's what happens on the way. Um, so you can kind of interact with them if you want to, or you can make me a perception check to kind of uh, find your way to the control room. Oh, if, if they're close enough, uh, I'm definitely going to go across and uh, mm. see yeah. how they're doing. Doctor, uh, uh, Bill sort of like nudges the doctor and is like, did they say he was going to be recycled? Yeah. It did sound like that, yes. We need to keep them away from Graham then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think we have much to worry about. He's still several millennia younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's push on, shall we? Age is just a concept that you humans have come up with to uh, <laughs> deem people unfit for proper work. That's all I say. And it seems like they've taken it to extremes here. Savarin, was that the fellow's name? It was Shezrin. Shezrin. As he kind of go up to him and he just says, Oh, hello. Hello, Shezrin. Uh, that seems to be a nasty bit of a a sprain you've got there. Is, is uh, everything okay? Yeah, uh, it's just an accident in the in the in the western fields. It won't be bothering you much longer, I'm sure. Is that the uh, redundancy coming in? Not not one for being made redundant myself. There's always so much to do, so little time. <laughs> time, yes. Yes. Yes, always precious little of it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honoured that I can continue to to serve paradise after my celebration. Do you hear that, Graham? It is Eden after all. <laughs> uh, so your celebration—you don't seem to be. Uh, oh, how can we best put this? Particularly keen on it. Well. All lives must end. And if I cannot serve paradise alive, then it's only right that I serve it another way. Mm. It's just a broken leg. Can't I, can't I fix that? I mean, I, I've got through, like, I mean, remission from cancer. I mean, that's, that's, that's just a broken leg. I mean, I, surely they can fix that. I, I don't know anyone who would be able to. Besides, it's my time. You don't have any doctors here. I, uh, I don't think I know what that is. Excuse me. What you know, is a doctor? A, you know, a medical professional who heals wounds and makes people better. Oh. Both of them kind of look at each other in like a, a little bit, but like. Who are you people again? The scene is very technician here to fix right. an issue that you've got. Don't don't worry about that. Okay. I would have that leg seen too though before you go to your redundancy party. You're not gonna be up to much dancing otherwise. Do you like a jelly baby? Ruffle my bag under his nose. Uh yeah, he does take a jelly baby. Let me just look up the effects of jelly baby right <laughs> Utter joy. <laughs> 
not sponsored by Jelly Baby. I'll, uh, <laughs> as, he's, as he's nibbling on a Jelly Baby, I'll slowly take a, a walk around him. Like somebody buying a horse. Just uh, giving him once over up and down. You said he appeared to be, apart from the, the crutches, he looked a little bit older than yeah. other people we've seen so far. Are we talking decade older or just a few years? If, if, if most people are around about 30 to 40, is he sort of creeping up on 60 or is he in his 50s? Or Probably a bit less. I think most people 20 to 30 and he looks like he's virginal 40. Oh, my word. Youngster. Have you found my op? Awesome jelly babiness. Uh, dude, this is very nice if it is making me feel better, but it doesn't change what's going to happen. Yes. Um, Maybe we can speak to someone in charge, you know, work out how to help him. I'll tell you what will happen. You, you have to go off to get ready for your party, but you can have, you can have guests, yes? Yes, yes, we're on our way now. It should start. Oh, you, should def- you should definitely add me and my companions to your list. We wouldn't miss a party for the world. Um, okay. Um, what are your names? And uh, as he says that, the two um, sea urchin type drone mm-hmm. orb things kind of return and say, Attention, Shezrin Labourer, you are now officially redundant. Please move to Farewell Facility 3 post haste. Or you'll be forced to begin your life celebration and recycle immediately. Make any requests for anyone you wish to attend the celebration. Oh, that's excellent. I look up the urchin. I'm so glad you're here to add us to the guest list. Uh, that'll be the doctor, uh, capital D, small r. And then I'm joined by uh, Bill and Graham. You, you wave know, at the urchin. Which is, which is, <laughs> Just add us to that. that. That would be terrific. Thank you. Splendid. Don't let us detain you. Here we go. Yeah, Shesrin repeats your names, and um, the urgent things do not go. They actually escort all uh, five of you now to a, um, uh, a cheerfully decorated kind of, it looks like a kind of a stone igloo mm-hmm. inside this big dome. They lead you inside, and uh, there's kind of a cheerfully decorated interior, the circular room. Um, There's a ring of decorative pillars that have uh, kind of murals of forests painted on them. And it's kind of like Stonehenge in the way that it's put together in a ring. Um, The room uh, has several tables and chairs arranged around the dancing area. And um, there are quite a few adults that look at Shezrin, kind of nod and raise drinks that look like they're from like stone earthenware cups mm-hmm. um, and are eating simple food. Um, in the center of the room, there's like a, a raised dais and you can hear like the really strong rhythmic, uh, polyrhythmic music, mm-hmm. like um, quite kind of tribal stuff. In, on differently sized and shaped percussion instruments made from like animal skins and leaves and things, wood. Um, and there is a hex shaped trap door in the center of the dais next to a uh, little control panel. And um, as you're kind of ushered in by these urchins, they uh, kind of push Kalas and Shezron up onto this dais. Mm-hmm. Um, and he kind of says, thank you, everyone, for coming, um, especially you, Callas. Uh, thank you for getting me here. I wish that we could have had um, more time together. But it's the final voyage has come upon me. And in kind of contrast to his, it seems like, sadness, all the other people in here are just going, yeah, woo <laughs> Go Shazrin! They're really <laughs> quite happy about this. And um, as they're cheering, he kind of turns and uh, presses a button on the control panel. And uh, the hex kind of swivels open the trap door and a um, coffin-sized chamber comes up mm-hmm. and he steps inside. 
Um, gives one last kind of tearful wave. Uh, the door slides shut and the chamber slides back into the floor. Um, everyone kind of clinks their drinks uh, and dissipates, talking about, you can hear kind of hubbub about, oh, right, let's get back to work, let's get back to the farms. Um, Kalas is sobbing and there's a few people kind of escorting him, presumably back to where he needs to work. Uh, yeah. And you're left alone in here. Uh, as people are sort of like milling around and stuff, can would, can I use Bill's wavelength wizard thing to try and get a vibe on people? Because it's more for like an individual, but like when they're all sort of like yelling and whooping and stuff, did it actually feel like they genuinely were happy? Or is it like something they were putting on or what sort of? No, no. Yeah, they thought it was good. Yeah. They okay. think it's great. Whatever has happened, they... Oh. Big thumbs up and full <laughs> approval for... <laughs> Whatever just yeah. happened here. Oh boy. Yeah, Bill looks at, the, the, at Graham and the doctor and is just like, we need to we need to work out what's going on here. That's that's weird. Uh <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very unsettled. I don't I don't like it at all. Yes, but I mean this seems like a terrible, terrible thing. But is that the terrible thing we're here to deal with? I mean, their civilization clearly has issues, but could that be causing the disruption that uh, I need to deal with? Possibly, possibly. I'll start wandering around the um, the pillars, mm -hmm. trying to get a sense of, are they just a feature or is it something technological behind the pillars? Uh, yeah, just by kind of touching them and looking at them, you can tell that the only real technology in this room is... Um, the actual hex trapdoor and the little control panel that's connected to it. Um, you can actually see on this thing, there's loads of rooms, actually a little touchpad, but it seems to have been modified to have a very big, obvious button on it, mm. rather than to use any of the complexity of this machine. It's been reduced to big button, press now. Like a, a failing civilization. They've reached their peak. And, and now they're sort of coasting around a, a, a downward uh, sort of degeneration. Mm -hmm. There aren't the people around to handle complicated things. So they're left with simplicity until the, the whole thing falls over. I think we really need to have a look in the control room. And we need to find someone in charge. <laughs> I fear mm -hmm. that when we get to the control room, we'll find that there's nobody in charge. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, then. So you kind of look around a bit more, and you do find some, um, uh, like, a set of stairs that wind around the, um, the dome in different ways, but they seem to be guarded by three of these um, kind of sea urchin-type floating thingies. And as you come up, they say, halt and submit to identification. Ah, oh, just go. I'm the doctor. I'm just brass on past. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what they will do in this situation. No one's ever doctored me that hard before. <laughs> <laughs> Have you not met me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they will kind of move together to form mm. like a big spiky wall and oh. uh, block your path and say, please present identification or state your identification number. I've got my identification right here. Uh, let me just check, take a step back, reach into my pockets. I come out with my sonic screwdriver and hold it up and give them a bit of the woo 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 woo. Because <laughs> you know, I'm curious. Meanwhile, me meanwhile, Bill is fishing for her driver's license. <laughs> Just one hand behind me, waving <laughs> Graham and Bill back down the stairs. Um, as uh, you pull it out and press the little switch, one of the um, sea agents turns red and goes, "Possible weapon identified." Weapon? I've never been so offended in my life. Don't you know what the sonic screwdriver's for? It's for many things, but it's not a weapon. Clearly, you haven't undergone any sort of uh, 
maintenance in quite a long time. Uh, this Aggressive is tone, me, detective. <laughs> Entering stun mode. And uh, we will enter a little encounter here. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Entering stun mode, I love that. <laughs> okay. So, um, a few things about how uh, combat or encounters work in mm -hmm. Doctors and Daleks. We prefer to use encounters because um, there's not a lot of traditional fighting. Uh, the big thing that you might have noticed on the first big thing you might notice on the character sheet is that you have plot points mm -hmm. instead of hit points. Um, and the opponents that you'll face in encounters also have plot points. So, this doesn't just measure how much you can get hit. It's also a measure of kind of your resolve, your will to continue. So a disparaging comment can actually deal plot points worth of damage. Mm. And when you run out of plot points, you might not be unconscious. You might just be, you know, too sad to continue or completely demoralized or taken out of the encounter in some way. And to go along with this, you've probably noticed that your attacks or quips don't deal your classic uh, Dungeons and Dragons bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage. Uh, they can deal emotional and logical damage. Um, as long as you're dealing emotional or logical damage, uh, you don't have to worry about actually hurting someone. Um, if you do deal anything that isn't emotional or logical damage, then that means the co the encounter is escalated to violence. And any time you try to use talking it out, it will be harder. Basically, you'll have disadvantage to talk your way out of things, or your opponent will have advantage on any saving throws. So most of combat is basically you using your quips. Mm -hmm. Actually, I just have to ask quickly, did we send you over any copies of the, the current book where it is right now? Yes. Yeah, I've got that. Oh, excellent. Okay, then. So the quips, the full descriptions are in there because some of those I could fit onto the character sheets. So That's quips, fine. there's loads of different ones. The ones that everyone has are emotional and logical arguments. So basically, you make an argument against your opponent to try and get them to stop fighting or do what you want, and that will deal plot points worth of damage. And there's also parlay, which is basically, please stop fighting completely, um, which is kind of like your get out of free card when it works, but it's quite difficult to pull off. And um, each of you will have other specialized quips that work kind of like D&D 5e spells, but are different in that they're all very focused on kind of social sparring, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the main two changes to combat. The third is the initiative system, which is will be somewhat familiar if you know anything about um, the Doctor Who role-playing game. You no longer roll for initiative unless you really want to. The way initiative works is at the start of every round, Everyone declares what they're going to be doing, mm -hmm. and that determines who goes first. So talkers always go first. So if you're planning on using a quip or trying to make an argument to stop the fighting, you go first, no matter what. If you're going to do something, um, then you go second. And doing something is basically anything that isn't talking or attacking. Mm -hmm. Attackers always go last. Anyone tries to do physical harm to anyone or anything, they go last in initiative. So it kind of prioritizes talking your way out of situations. If you're trying to run away or do something like hack a computer, then you'll be going second. And if you're actually doing any kind of physically hard, physical harm, which the doctor hates, then you go last. And uh, just the caveat on how that works as well is the the players always go first and the NPCs go second. Mm -hmm. And if two players would go at the same time, it's up to you to decide who goes first. So with that info dump out of the way, um, does anyone have any questions about how combat works or will we just jump into it? Oh, oh no, I'm, I'm quite happy to jump straight in. Feet first, you may have noticed that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right then, so I'll ask each of you, what would you like to do with your turn? Is anyone going to talk? Yes. 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 All right then. And Doctor, what's your plan? Um, if if I decide to use a logical argument, I was about to do exactly the same kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> that counts as talking. Yes. So, yeah. so in that case, yes, I also want to talk. I've talked us into this. I can talk <laughs> us out. We've I've been here many times. All right. Excellent. Okay then. So, out of the three of you, who would like to go first? Well, I'm I'm not very good at 
talking. So what I was going to do was use motivation and um, sort of motivate the doctor into being particularly good in their um, speech mm. and, and give you a D6 bonus. Mainly, I don't want to be stunned, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm a goner if you don't get us out of this because I'm obviously the oldest one here. Uh, well, <laughs> physically, I look like the oldest one here. <laughs> so pre- please talk us out of this one. Well, Bill, do you have any pressing urge to go before me? Yeah, I think I'm going to try and help you in your actions instead. So I'm going to use oh. my helping hand to give you the a little bit of a bonus, you see. So. It's almost like people believe that my dice rolling is not sufficient to carry the day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, Bill's I, gonna, I, yeah. Bill, Bill, to help, Bill pokes the doctor in the back and, and is like, we didn't do anything bad yet. <laughs> they don't need to stun us. <laughs> it's not like you touched anything. Exactly. <laughs> like, well, my companions will go first. Um, to offer me aid and sucker in this time of need, and then uh, and then Jerry, it'll be me. Uh, and Jerry's going to roll a one. <laughs> <laughs> so you're using a logical argument. I'm going to use a logical. Well, it's a very simple logical argument. Sea urchins. Oh yeah, so it's a DC check for them, isn't it? You know, why would yes. I be here if I hadn't been summoned to be here to fix you? Mm. Mm, Otherwise, I wouldn't be on argument. these stairs. I wouldn't be coming up to the control room. You know. Oh, Clearly, you've been right. alone for too long, tiny sea urchins. And you said you get a, a D6 bonus, Graham? Uh, yes, yeah, you get a D6 bonus from me for motivating you. Uh, right. Roll a D6 then, and we will subtract it from their uh, saving throw roll. Three. Three. Nothing if not average. Fantastic. So they actually rolled a, uh, a 14, and your saving throw DC is... A 12 I've got 12. here for the yeah. fourth doctor so it brings it in so that it does indeed affect them oh. and um, that's a pretty good logical argument like why would I be here if not to fix you uh, this is my uh, sea urchin fixing device here I am with my tools <laughs> on these stairs otherwise it makes no sense at all for me to even be up here so they are actually vulnerable to logical damage because they oh. are uh, kind of robotic, semi-robotic, like bio constructs. So roll your d6 and you'll do double damage. Ooh, five, so ten. Ooh, ten damage. Um, just another note on combat. This is more of a behind-the-scenes thing. But um, how a lot of the encounters work in Doctors and Daleks is the entire encounter as an amount of plot points, rather than you have individual. to take down individual enemies. Yeah, that's right. They all share the same pool of resolve. So if you want to talk them down, you can just talk to anyone and it'll bring the whole yeah. situation oh, that's, to close. That's good. Because I'd hate to have to explain this to two very stupid sea urchins after I've dealt with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> two of the sea urchins are indeed trying to also figure out what's going on. Like, they're not very good at making logical arguments, but they just say, you must submit to the needs of paradise and provide us with some kind of identification. Back down now and surrender, or you will be stunned. I know what uh, you mean. Bear with me, you should have said so earlier. This is outrageous. I mean, pop my sonic screwdriver back in my pocket and then root around and uh, bring out my old Blockbuster video card membership. <laughs> 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 There's my identification. You'll quite like these. Uh, won't be around for long, but uh, very good when they are. <laughs> says All right. the doctor. Both of those were trying to make a logical argument against you. They are not very good at it. So um, it already seems like you're confident in the face of them. Mm. So if you could make two um, intelligence saving throws for me. Oh, okay. they're not on there, but you should have a plus five to that. Survey says, oh, swing and a miss with a big one right off the bat. And the second one, 17 plus five. Ah, yeah, right second one's that. fine. First one, not so much. So for the first one, you are going to take five logic damage. Oh, uh, my plot points are down to 10. Ooh. And this is most the... up and coming, having to argue with minions on the staircase. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one is straight up going to try and stun you. Uh, the one that detected the sonic screwdriver as a weapon seems to be going rogue. Uh, uh, it's clearly the one most on the fritz and most in need of maintenance. 
Uh, but they only rolled a 10, which I think is below your armor yeah. class. And you managed class to, 12. You managed to jump out of the way, slightly singes the edges of your scarf, but uh, the stun beam does not hit you. So now we're back around to the top of initiative. Who would like to talk? Bill would like to logic them, if, 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 that, if, if that's good, yeah. <laughs> so go for it. Uh, Bill's going to try and like step in front of the doctor um, and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't even know what paradise is. Surely it's best for you to tell us before you stun us. <laughs> that was pretty good. I like that. Uh, they rolled a... so That wasn't an emotional response. <laughs> I guess, maybe, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think that that's like you're talking about the order of events and like yeah. trying rather to than start us explain that. the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they rolled a twelve. Cool. So I get, a, I get a D six then, don't I? So yeah, give me a D six and double it because they're weak to logic damage. Uh, so eight in total. So. Eight. Very good. Yeah, you can see um, that your arguments are having some effects as one of them is cycling through colours very very quickly, trying to land on the right one. <laughs> Um, but it doesn't seem to be working perfectly. Um, one of them is going to talk, and two of them is go- are going to try and stun you. Would anyone else like to talk? Oh, well, I'll also be backing up my already magnificent uh, logical argument once again. I, go, I mean, I, I don't know where else we're going to go with this, to be brutally honest. You've asked to see my identification. I've shown you my identification. <laughs> I've told you why I'm here on these stairs, yet all I seem to be getting is nothing but colours and sounds. If I'd want to talk to uh, a, a simple Simon game, uh, then I would have contacted Tommy, but you know, uh, really, Eden, you're letting the side down completely, sending out these half-wits. Appeal to authority, very strong. Oh, yeah. I am the technician and I am in charge here. Yeah, uh, all right then. Uh, let's see what they roll. These guys don't roll well. They only got a nine on that one. Um, yeah, give me your logic damage. Mm, eight. Eight. Is that with the double? Well, that's it with double, yeah. Yeah, okay, very good. So, oh, yeah, they're all kind of spinning in weird ways now. Um, and, uh, Graham, what would you like to do? I was, I was honestly not sure if I could talk my way out of this one. So I was going to back up and start unscrewing the top of my flask. Just in <laughs> case. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> just just turn on the stairs and just look at Graham drinking his tea go. Fair enough. I was, uh, I was going to be uh, I'm armed with some lukewarm tea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that you guys have put yourself into enough of a position of logical defiance. I'm screwing. <laughs> You've uh, not necessarily defeated these drones. Um, you have confused them using uh, logic to um, frazzle their systems enough that I will say this encounter is over. You've quipped them pretty hard in classic Doctor Who fashion, <laughs> and you have a clear path up to the um, top of the control then. Okay. Up through as quick as possible, I reckon, yeah. But edging up when you finish your picnic, Graham. <laughs> I'm just t- tightening the top up back up again. <laughs> I don't, I don't know up. what I'll see in you in future. It has to be said. I just don't know what I'll see in you. <laughs> Clearly, you, you're here for a reason, though. Come on. Uh, as you kind of make your way up, Graham, you do notice um, that one of the, uh, the drones is kind of uh, squeaking out a little bit of... Um, and if the information that's left over in its brain kind of says technicians code for security control room five nine five um and it seems uh that they are actually giving you a code to get oh. past the security and were somewhat convinced by your um assertions that you were here to help Sandy. <laughs> Mm. I imagine whenever you went on a union break in the middle of that little foray there, that probably sealed the deal for them. <laughs> Clearly he's a technician. It's lunchtime. He's having a cup of tea. <laughs> and day break's very important. Very important. <laughs> so, you um, 
reach the top of this uh, dome, and it's quite a sight below you, all of these kind of strange buildings with the windows and doors and weird places and a lot of plant life. Um, and you manage to open the security door mm -hmm. and see this large uh, kind of office-like space. Um, it, the dome in it is clear, so there's this grand view of all of the city. And they also seem to have a view of the, the not just the deserts that are beyond the dome, but the other domes as well. There seems to be patches of them that could be seen through from here. Um, and they all seem to be farms. Uh, there's quite a lot of um, control panels, similar to ones that you saw on the streets below, um, all kind of connected up. The tech you notice now is kind of a combination of traditional kind of electronic stuff, um and like coral reefs it looks like it's quite an interesting system that uses bioelectricity um and you can see three individuals um a uh, a gray haired slightly older woman again quite unusual um a man with a uh, thin pursed lips and heavy lidded eyes and a uh, impassive, um, androgynous uh, person kind of lounging in the back on one of these consoles. And as you come in, the, the man kind of uh, stomps over to you quite and goes, Who are you and what are you doing here? I'm the doctor. I'm supposed to be here. The question is, what are you doing here? You look a bit older than the rest of the people. Should you not be made redundant by now? Or is redundancy just for the little people below you? That's a ludicrous statement. We are the triumvirate. Oh, you're the triumvirate. Oh, I should have known you were the triumvirate. I turn around and look at my companions. They're the triumvirate. See? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't we a triumvirate as well? Yeah. We're a triumvirate. We're not the triumvirate. Oh, we're not okay. the triumvirate. We are the triumvirate. And um, <laughs> the slightly older woman comes forward and says, now... Now, now, Orton, these strangers, uh, are, you, are you dangerous? It's quite hard to tell. Like, what's going on here? I don't know what the doctor is. How did you get in? Oh, I find a way to get into most places where people don't want me to get into. That's Although, quite threatening. Oh, no, it's not threatening at all. Why should it be threatening? People need help wherever I go. That's not a threat, is it? I'm just helping out. That's why friends, they carry things, don't you? Graham's got tea. Would you like a cup of tea? I find it calms things down wonderfully. Um, can you give me a persuasion check, please? I'll certainly try. Mm, I will not, will I? What's my persuade? Oh, I might actually. 13. 13, yeah. You can see um, the grey-haired woman's eyes kind of shine for a moment and she kind of half smiles. Um, more in curiosity, you probably guess, but doesn't seem to have a problem. And um, the man kind of steps up against this. You Me. are trespassing mm. on yes. sacred ground. This is our control room, and we don't need your help. Don't you, though? I find everybody needs a bit of help on occasion. Why should you be any different? This is paradise. Everything here is perfect. Is it? I've just seen somebody taken out to redundancy. Like a horse because he broke his leg. It doesn't seem like paradise to me. I think a yes, paradise is some flaws. Yes, serve us perfectly. They're effort. just caretakers. They don't need to live that long. They only need to live as long as they can work. Mm, definitely doesn't sound like paradise to me. Have you been here long, Orton? I've been here for plenty of years. At least ten. At least ten. Thanks, he looks so. much older than 10. Yeah. Do, do you know how long a year is? <laughs> well, yes. Like, it's 365 days, I think. Well, we've got that much in common, at least. Or you do with the Earthlings. It's a bit different on Gallifrey. These places sound like they're worse than paradise, I have to tell you. Oh, no. Well, maybe Earth. It has its moments. There's some places I wouldn't. No, just wouldn't. Anyway, but Gallifrey, marvellous, except after the war. Mm. No. 
Yeah, wouldn't go there at all. You're right. Some places are much worse than paradise. But, you know, everything is relative, I suppose. Speaking of relatives, do you have any? Sons, daughters, friends? Well... You must be awfully lonely up here, looking down, all the little people like ants below you. What do you mean by sons and daughters? We we are friends. We're the triumvirate. Families? Well, we are all a family. Test tube. What? I'm just curious. I just wondered whether or not that was your mother's name, Test Tube. <laughs> Are you Test Tube baby? You've got to come from somewhere, someone. If not a bit of Pyrex, maybe a person. Bill's like, yeah, who are your mums, who are your mothers and fathers? Um, as the, as Autumn kind of seethes with rage and confusion, you seem uh, pushed back by the grey-haired woman and he kind of stomps off again to a computer console. She just says, um, you are newcomers here, it seems, and I don't understand a lot of your words, but I believe you're here to help. Um, what are you here to help with? That is a more interesting question than you know. I feel there's something... It's going to happen here at Paradise uh, that could be detrimental for all of you. Uh, so I'm here to make sure that that doesn't happen. Or maybe it will. Maybe I'm here to make sure it does happen. Complicated, isn't it? Yes. Why don't you tell me what you do as part of the tram for it? And I'll see whether or not I can help you with that. Right. Well, you said about children. Hmm. There, so there are no children in paradise. Children only result from lesser creatures and food stock. Um, the caretakers like, might like have caretakers. been... Well, they might have been animals once, but they're a living, a living part of the colony now. We're all part of paradise. Um, and in the background, you kind of hear Autumn go, the colony is angry with the caretakers for failing to maintain it properly. That's why more of them have to be made redundant. Um, and uh, Halas kind of continues and says that um, the, the, this paradise was built by the first train for centuries ago and provides for all the needs of the caretakers. And in return, the caretakers protect and maintain it. When they can't do that, they're made redundant so that the paradise can continue to provide for everyone else. Rather circular reasoning there, I feel, from the colony. Colony needs the caretakers because the caretakers need the colony. And so we go on and on without ever actually moving. Oh, perhaps you need me more than you thought. Is there any history of the oh. colonies? Perhaps there's something one of these machines. Walk over and start pushing random buttons. <laughs> or <Awesome. laughs> like like pushes you off one of the machines and says, listen, the, the caretakers you know, only survive if they contribute to paradise and paradise can only survive with caretakers that contribute to it. That's how these things work. Once they're no longer useful, they're made for them, they get a nice life celebration. Isn't that oh, great? I and see then that. It was very jolly. A replacement that's ready to work again. I Maybe it would be easier just to make the people who got hurt better and build a sort of like pipes up. You know, doctors, medicine. All kind of look at, the three look at each other confused. And uh, the one in the back um, raises their hand and goes, I um, vote for allowing these strangers access to the mainframe. It seems like they know a lot of things. Maybe they can help us with a few of our problems. And Autumn uh, and says, we don't have any problems. Everything is fine. And I vote against these strangers having access to the mainframe. <laughs> she did say Colney was unhappy. Angry, you said. What well, we yes, it's Colney. It's 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 a little. It's it's angry. That's why there are so many more redundancies than there used to be. It sounds like it needs a good hug. Someone to sit down and talk to it. Maybe offer it some uh, some friendly advice. I've met colonies like this before, you know. Stroking the console. There, there. That's a good colony. We're all friends. <laughs> all right. I think that you guys, uh, just to convince the final um, member of the triumvirate, if you can make me a, each of you make a persuasion check, which is kind of your presence, the things that you've said, they'll represent all of those things. 
10. ten. For people playing along at home, I have a persuasion of seven plus seven. Oh. I'm so bad at rolling D20. Yeah. <laughs> Another feeling that I've got, I've got a plus four on mine and I still only roll nine. Oh no, it's down it's to all Bill. down to Bill. It's all down to Bill. Bill. Yeah. Uh, can I use my wavelength wizard again to try and get a bead on the last guy to try and like work out the best way to kind of persuade him? I think so, I think it's the lady, isn't it? Or is yeah, it the lady? The lady. Yeah. Oh, the lady she, is left. She's currently necking, um, necking cups of tea. Yeah. Let what? me. What you had cookies with you? Biscuits, <laughs> Graham. Did you not offer the lady biscuit? I couldn't find the bit in the TARDIS that that produced the custard creams. Oh. If you've looked in the Danish cookie tin, you would have found a selection of threads and needles. I don't know how that happens. I've never put a thread or a needle in a Danish cookie tin in my life, but they're all like that in the TARDIS. I've got a room full of them. You do have more, more uses of Wavelength Wizard. Um, so, yeah, you can kind of get a read on her. Um, whenever the Doctor was kind of talking about solving the problems here and um, talking about the the potential history of paradise. You could see that that was doing something like she was um, interested in that. Okay. So I'm going to try and persuade her with the idea that I'm going to take out my phone because I've got a smartphone on me and like flick it up and like show all the fancy buttons and all the little widgets on it and things. And be like, look at the amazing technology I have. We could have loads of things to teach you kind of thing. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. Give me a check for the advantage. Cool. Uh, so first off is a 14. Oh, sorry. And then the second roll, because it's advantage, isn't it? Oh, both were 14. There we go. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good job you did that. Yeah. Um, says, so this is a, this is like the console. Oh yeah. But it's in the palm of my hand. It's amazing. They grow up so fast, don't they? <laughs> Races, I, I mean, civilizations, not these people. They're still very young. I think, I think these people, these people might be able to help. Like, let's allow them to take a look at the the mainframe. And you see Orton have a little tantrum and he stomps away from the console that you were going to look at. Um, yeah, you can definitely try and muck around with the mainframe of Paradise if you'd like to. Oh, excellent. As Thank I start you. mucking around. I will just talk to the triumvirate. Lovely people. Have you met them? Um, so how long ago did the uh, colony start throwing these tantrums? Um, so when you're looking through the, the, the mainframe, so the, the triumvirate kind of don't know why things have been this bad or why they've been bad for so long. But um, uh, Paradise seems to be on a constant down run after a few centuries hmm. um give me a intelligence computers check as you're kind of looking to do this thing <laughs> survey says 15 15 all right then i'm going to give you a couple of pieces of information here then so pretty good um hmm yeah, you can find very quickly a list of faulty and failed systems. Um, it looks like these are actually relatively easy to fix. Like you would probably be able to fix all of them in about a week to a month. Mm -hmm. But it seems like there's huge gaps in everyone's knowledge because they've been broken for so long. Uh, yeah, this is like a, a lot of gaps in knowledge. Um, if I was to extrapolate out the failures, how long would it be before Paradise was just empty? Oh, probably uh, a generation or two. Oh, so they'd, they'd continue on this catastrophe for a while yet? Okay. Yeah, it seems that way. Like, um, as you kind of ponder that, you pull up, uh, you manage to find, like, the population hmm. and the rates of recycling, basically. And it seems like for um, a few decades now, the amount of redundancies and people being recycled has exceeded. Like people are being made redundant, but there are new people being made in the same amounts. Hmm. Like crops seem to have been worse um, and they're just slowly 
getting smaller and smaller in population. Um, in fact, in one of the dome gardens, there's only one gardener. Really weird. Um, we met him. Lovely chap. <laughs> uh, but yeah, things start, aren't looking great. There seems to be frequent attacks from dinosaurs. Um, yeah. Some, sometimes you just have to live with the dinosaur attacks, I'm afraid, Triumvirs. Um, <laughs> you know, when life gives you dinosaurs, make omelets. Build a theme park, that's the way. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never build a theme park with dinosaurs. <laughs> um, it's been a but, time. <laughs> as you As you're looking through the mainframe, um, Bill and Graham, can you both give me perception checks, please? Oh, yeah. 22. Uh, Oh, oh, only six. <laughs> six. It's all right. Well, Bill, you're kind of fascinated by the view more than anything. Yeah, uh, I'm just great. checking out, checking out that. Yeah, yeah. You notice, um, Ortab is uh, kind of sneaking up behind the doctor with like a mechanical device. Um, it looks like a cross between kind of a large iPad and a traffic cone, and he's pointing it at him and presses a big button on it and then just raises it up and down. And a small beam of light comes out and kind of washes over the doctor quite quickly. And then in a couple of moments, uh, all the lights in the room go out and the console that you're on, doctor, stops working. And then a alarm starts blaring, um, an almost organic sounding alarm, just like a like then somebody repeats. poked away over the stick. Yeah, basically, uh, like you did back like eight eight hundred years ago. Um, and uh, the red lights start flashing, and the computer uh, shows that uh, it's on a on a lockdown. And the mainframe itself, as you were kind of conversing with it before, Doctor, uh, it just says, hostiles have invaded the colony. Uh, Paradise is on lockdown pending orders from the masters. I have confirmation from at least two masters the colony will be sterilized in three hours. All caretakers must congregate in the promenade. Any caretaker who fails to do so in 15 minutes will be considered redundant. Oh, this seems just fantastic. I didn't do it. It wasn't me this time. Honest. Stand up and have a look around. Everybody bathed in the rosy glow of red alert lights. Yeah, everyone is panicking. So, you're the triumvirate, but are you the masters? What is going on here? I just scanned you. What? What is wrong? You're not caretakers at all. There must be something alien about you. I didn't say I was a caretaker. I told you I was the doctor, and I told you I was here to fix your problems. Well, the mainframe is saying you're a hostile. Mainframe and I were getting on like a house on fire. Hmm, bad terminology. Uh, <laughs> mainframe and I were getting on very well, I suppose. I don't know what happened. Maybe you do, Otten. You fancy um, jelly, baby. You should calm uh, yourself. I should. I, I, he's kind of panicking. We've got three hours. Angry, this will all sort itself out, I'm sure. When was the last time you or anybody you know heard from a master? As um, you say that to him, you see that the, the grey-haired woman, Halas, is kind of trying to get into the mainframe. She says, uh, um, my access is denied. It keeps saying that I'm a caretaker. I don't think the triumvirate count as the masters. We've never been called that. I've never heard that word really before. Mm, well, like, I've, heard, I've heard that word before. Terrible <laughs> fellow. You wouldn't like him. These other pods that we can see from here. The other habitats they're not connected to this one are they there's yes, the, there's yes. paradise as a, as a multi-potted thing but out on the horizon did you say beyond the desert we could see others uh give me a perception check you don't know if you've noticed anything yet survey says 13 again lucky for some 13 so you can see the um what you would consider paradise is a series of interconnected domes this one being the largest one um, you can see there isn't very much on the uh, horizon. Um, it seems to be quite flat. There's a few like um, kind of mountainous formations that look like they could be uh, geysers or hot springs and things like that in the desert, but it looks pretty plain. Um, 
you can try to uh, negotiate with the mainframe itself. If anyone has any skill with computers or is particularly intelligent. I, I have computers. I have computers, yes. So I can tinker with that. All right. Yeah. Can Give I use can I use my open minded ability then as well? So this allows me to uh, pick any skill at all that you oh, oh no, I do have a proficiency in it, but my skill my tech level's probably quite low, I guess. Mm. Um so I can I say use that you've been around for this technology enough now. You've been here for a couple of hours. Um I would let you do that. Yeah, sure. You can so have I can, um yeah. I think I get my proficiency bonus like half again, don't I, on the tech check or something with it? Is that well, usually what would happen if you're trying to use technology that's outside of your tech level, you just okay. always have disadvantage. Right. Um, even if it's downwards, so like say if you were trying to use like a flintlock pistol or like a 12th century mill, you yeah. wouldn't know what you were doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in this case, it's a bit too, it's just weird tech to you. So I'll say that you don't have disadvantage. Okay, cool. And I'll give it a go. So yeah, roll that. Um, ooh, uh, 18. There we 18. go. 18? Yeah. Sweet. All right. Yeah. You very quickly figure out two things, and Graham just being generally observant kind of helps you with the first one. Um, you can see, like, from here and from the doctor looking around, that the uh, system is definitely overheating, and um, it seems that, like, from looking through the computer systems, all of the power seems to be coming from one dome, from which you can see these huge tubes and what looks to be some kind of nuclear reactor, um, it's going to overheat uh, within those three hours, and the colony won't just be sterilised, there will be a nuclear explosion. It will, it will pass on that information. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. It looks um, like it's going to blow, Doctor. <laughs> yeah, the, main frame, the mainframe is super calm about this, because the mainframe is like, the masters are just in the grotto, which is reasonably close by. And that's all it really says. It gives you a location. Um, yeah, that's uh, so, it. So Bill's going to take a photo of the, of the location where the grotto is <laughs> and directions to the power plant <laughs> with her phone. <laughs> while, you're, while you're in there, can you get the mainframe to grant us some form of uh, access if the place is on lockdown we i'd still like to be able to pass between the various pods and tubes otherwise we'll just have to well unscrew the hinges so to speak on every door we come to i'd well, rather avoid that, that if we can there was that code that that spiky thing said mm, five, i got five, you in five, here i got you in here but if you try that on anything it's not going to work. That yeah. was a caretaker code, basically. Oh, you see, can I see if Bill can see if you can find the thing to do with that? Yeah, to care, with like a sort of ultimate access kind of thing. I'll just leave <laughs> up your shoulder. What happens if you press that one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will say what we can do here is um, just based on this point of the adventure, you wouldn't ever have time to go to the grotto and to the power plant. Mm. So what we're going to do is, this is a mechanic, it's, it comes up in a few systems, but it's slightly different in Ducks and Daleks. We're going to make a collaborative check. Um, and this will be a series of like narrative checks to get you through the security and to the TARDIS. It's kind of like a chase thing. So because the security is so tight, you've access to the computer, you've access to all of your skills and abilities, mm -hmm. Your job is to get to the TARDIS. How this will work is each of you will make three ability checks and kind of narratively describe how you're going to help the team get back to the TARDIS through all of the security. So, for example, to start off with, you could make this uh, computer's check to try and get some access through the security. And the other two, you you can come up with some kind of narrative way to aid or do something else that's get you closer to the TARDIS. Well, I'll, I'll give that uh, computer check a go and see if we can get us fi fired up. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a crit. So, <laughs> so t 22 in total. So, <laughs> 22, yeah. So, the security doors 
um, you will be able to bypass uh, without making a check going forward. Um, so you've managed to succeed on that one. And then the other two of you, how are you going to get out of here quickly? Um, because it seems like the uh, sea urchins things as well are kind of flying around and herding people into the promenade. Uh, perception's my best talent. It's not my best thing. So probably it's going to be a case of spotting where the sea urchins are and um, making sure we can navigate out of there. Plot a, plot a course. Yeah. So, have us so they don't, them. don't yeah. spot us with their vision. Perfect. Give yeah. me a perception check. Cool. Okay, so that was uh, 14, wasn't 14. it? Right? Yeah, yeah. It's a DC 14 check, so oh. you just about <laughs> manage it. So you manage to plot a course, and you're getting through the security doors as Bill, as you come to each one, just like uh, uses her phone and like holds up against it like a QR code, and then <laughs> uses the edge of the phone to smash <laughs> off the control panel and pull a few wires, now that you understand it, and can yeah. get past every single one of these doors. Uh, Graham's going, no, that way, no, that way. He's remembering all of the different patrol routes that he's seen throughout the day, and you're moving through and in between uh, the buildings of the promenade, like the high windows and the low doors, all of the strange architecture. Uh, Doctor, what are you doing to aid the escape? I will. Luster. <laughs> <laughs> I will bask in my companions. <laughs> Just a sheer genius and ingenuity. Somebody needs to keep a cool head when all of this is going on, you know, and sometimes you bring lucky companions, sometimes you bring spark companions. In my case, I've brought the companions I need to help me uh, do the mission when we get there. Um, if when we get to the TARDIS, though, obviously the major issue is in three hours or possibly less, a nuclear explosion removing paradise from the face of this world, um, which I'm not at home to in any way, shape, or form. So. Time is uh, is a factor, which is very annoying for a Time Lord. Very, very annoying. Uh, I'm going to try and work out the best way to cease the destruction of this. Obviously, my initial urge would be to go straight to the reactor and try and get it to cool itself. But I'm wondering whether or not the grotto and finding the masters might be more beneficial you assuming you, that they are still alive you mean it's sort of weighing up the options kind of thing mm. yeah yeah so in terms of sector investigation to kind of figure out what the best course of action is 20 20 nice. it's not a natural okay. 20 but it will be a 20 a dirty 20 <laughs> <laughs> So the thing about collaborative checks is there's kind of a catch-all clause that if everyone succeeds on the first try, then we don't have to play out the rest of it. I'll just know what happens next. Um, Doctor, you, uh, as you're kind of thinking through all this and congratulating yourself on picking good companions to move you <laughs> from place to place while you do your thing, um, <laughs> you basically think that like uh, this place is in deep trouble and from looking around, they don't know what the technology is. They can't keep this place running. Anything you do in terms of stopping its destruction is just kind of extending the inevitable. Mm -hmm. You can tell, like, just based on the fact that, like, the windows are low down and some of the doors are, like, way, way off the ground and they've had to build stairs to get to them. Like, this place wasn't built for these people. Something is totally wrong here. Like, there's strange plants, there's recycled people, and there is someone called the Masters who isn't here right now. And that's why this place is all going to pot. You need to get them. And you're actually starting to get a little bit angry with them because, you know, they've basically created life and are not looking after it very well. Mm. So to the that's where we go. Mm. The grotto. All right. You've made it to the TARDIS. So uh, as this is just a short jaunt, it only requires one person to make a temporal vehicles check 
to pilot the TARDIS without traveling through time. Still not easy, but hopefully you don't crash. Please don't well, crash. you're always traveling through time, whether you want to or not. <laughs> That's true. It's one of, the, one of the most important things you should know before you ever touch that console on my ship. <laughs> Which is why I'm not touching it. Yeah. <laughs> not, not after the last time. <laughs> Seventeen, correct. Graham, yeah. correct. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was the seventeen. Seventeen, yeah, yeah. yeah. Seventeen, very 17. good. Mm. Yeah, you actually managed to get. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, okay then. Uh, yeah, that's a high enough score that you actually, rather than just flying it, you can dematerialize and rematerialize. Nice into the same space, which is useful as you step out. You realize that, like, oh, this is indeed a grotto. It is inside, like, a um, one of those um, geysers or, like, hot springs. Mm-hmm. And there's you've landed on, by perfectly following the coordinates, just, like, a metal walkway that leads to a door that is inside, kind of, the caldera of one of these things. And as you look up above you, um, you are stunned to see that there is a dinosaur kind of lazily sleeping on the hot air vents of this thing. That uh, Had you rolled slightly lower, you would have flown into the side of this caldera and you would have had to deal with this. But... <laughs> well, you know what they say, let sleeping dinosaurs lie back up <laughs> very gingerly. All right. So you come across a, another control panel of a similar technology to what you saw um, before. Uh, uh, I think it's actually, oh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to use. Can someone make me a intelligence security tools or intelligence computers check to try and get past this? I, I'll do this thing. It's not just right. my five again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll tell you in a minute whether or not it is. Uh, Graham, you actually try that on it, and it says um, lock to caretakers, masters only. Oh. 22. 22. Nice. Whoa. Yeah, you... I have to get um, a decent roll eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you not only managed to bypass the security on this uh, console, you finally figure out what all this technology is. It's been bugging you for a while now. It's Silurian technology. Oh, joy. It all makes perfect sense. And now it makes sense why the doors and the windows were in the wrong place and the plants were having weird irrigation. The whole of paradise was meant to be flooded so that the Silurians could swim around. Hmm. Yes. Well, presumably they'll be lower down, keeping, assuming any of them are still here, keeping to some sort of large ponds. And um, as you go through the, the security doors into this place, you notice that your kind of meddling with the system has also um, awakened the masters. And it says on the little screen, the, the stasis pods have been deactivated and the reanimation protocols are online. And as you step into the room, it is very much uh, a similar situation to Paradise itself in that it is, sorry, one second here. Um, it's this strange grotto artificial cavern that's been dug out from the inside and it has a load of environmental controllers like misters and things like that to mimic kind of the the cretaceous period there's lots of ferns and um in the center of this uh, kind of artificial cavern in a grotto is a huge pool um that looks like it's filled with all manner of like colorful fish and crustaceans and mollusks that are kind of moving around it and um, three uh, kind of like egg-shaped um, coffins mm-hmm. that rise up out of the water, breaking it. And the doors open on all three of them. And there are three Silurians 
holding sonic blasters and pointing them at you. Just like, <laughs> who dares disturb us? Who dares disturb you? You've an awful lot of cheek, haven't you? you? And you can go ahead and lower those blasters immediately, unless you want to end up like the rest of that pitiful habitat above you. What have you been doing? Hmm? Absentee you, uh, landlords, that's what you are. You will address us as the triad. Oh, will I? Well, then you may address me as the doctor. Very well, doctor. And Bill shouts over his shoulder, and we're also a trio. It's all in threes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Bill. Very good. <laughs> How long have you been asleep here? Do you even know what's happening on this planet? I assume that since we have been awoken, that the celestial events have aligned and it's now an aquatic world. No, you've been awoken because upstairs your little caretaker program is falling apart and you're about, oh, look at my wrist, three hours away from an atomic explosion that will reduce what's left of the pitiful example of life that you've built to nothing but hot radioactive rubble. And with it, your little podling down here. Well, the well, old what? ship? Oh, it's the caretakers, isn't it? What? If that's what you want to call them. Listen, the loss of the ship is really not important. We can wait and go back to sleep. The loss of the ship isn't important. You're like children with an ant farm. You shouldn't be allowed to control life. You can barely control yourselves. You pull me. And that's your answer, is it? Back into your little eggs, hide in your pods, wait for the world to change. Hmm? You are definitely making a strong emotional argument right now. So I will say that we are going to initiative and you are taking the first turn. Um, this is one way that you can play with Doctors and Daleks that I'd like to showcase is that like, you don't necessarily have to, if you're struggling in a, a role play situation, as I often am to kind of gauge exactly what what will happen next you can just play it out like an encounter and have this back and forth um so uh i will say that's a really strong emotional argument um they are going to have disadvantage on the role to resist it and you will deal damages though so you did a crit uh just to kind of measure this out so they got a 10 on disadvantage mm -hmm. which i believe is under your saving throw dc so it please is. give me your damage yeah. D6 once again. Uh, yes, if it's an emotional argument. Two. Double it. Four. Ooh. They do look taken aback by this, though, and they kind of just say, they're, they're ape primitives. They've been getting more and more aggressive. We can't look after them. There's no need for us to be there. Well, clearly there was a need for you to be there. Otherwise, it wouldn't have got into such a pitiful state of repair. And I use the re word repair quite wrongly, you understand. Why did you bring them with you in the first place, if your plan was just to hide here in your eggs and wait for the world they, to turn? They were to be our servants. This was supposed to be a water world, but it became a desert. That's why we've been sleeping. We've been waiting for it to become habitable again. <laughs> Tragic, truly tragic. The wind changes, the world becomes a desert, and you wait for it to change rather than doing something. You could have led these people. You um, could have made their life a paradise. Huh. Instead, they've been living in one, and it's just been slowly eating them, generation over generation. Very good. They don't get a saving throw on that. <laughs> I think that's probably enough to stop them. They're pretty much on the back foot. Uh, Bill, Graham, do you want to say anything? I can't, I, I'm afraid I might ruin that. That was too cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think that you have doctored these guys <laughs> effectively. Um, the three Silurians kind of, well, two of them lower their weapons. One of them kind of like shaking is looking at you with the gun raised and then 
slowly puts it down. Um, and uh, it says, you are more than one of these eight primitives. Me? I suppose that yes, if we a little bit work, more. could you work with us to rebuild paradise into somewhere where we could live with the caretakers? I can. I will. We'll need two of you to switch off whatever insane defense system that you've built because it seems to want to exterminate all of them upstairs. So if you can switch that off, I'll deal with the reactor. And then afterwards we'll see. You said this was a ship <laughs> once. Why not find somewhere a bit more hospitable for all of you so you're not having to deal with uh, dinosaurs scraping at your door on a regular basis? Perhaps they can live normal lives in an actual paradise and not this petri dish that you've developed. They uh, look amongst each other and says, usually this would be a matter for trial by combat. Combat? Under water, of course. I, uh, I, never, I never deal with the, the stuff, to be brutally honest. Perhaps we can deal with that after we have... Uh, yes solved this current pressing problem after there's always an after bill's gonna show her phone and she'd be like i'm a pretty good whiz with these things i'm sure i can help you guys out <laughs> <laughs> i got in here didn't i <laughs> yes yes you did <laughs> they do look genuinely impressed they're kind of like <laughs> um, and they will happily follow you back to the tardis um and uh, be quite amazed by the whole experience, expecting a shuttle and travel back and switch off the the um, the uh, the reactor, uh, end the lockdown, and kind of bring everything back to normal. Um, they'll explain to you that there are over a million other Silurians that were in that little pod area. They were just the triad, the first oh, wow. three that were supposed to um, actually encounter any resistance that might have come there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that with your help, like between adventures, you would maybe be able to either fix the ship and take everyone to a different planet or figure something out. Like you do know that like the the caretakers are obviously, um, they are test tube babies. They didn't know that, but uh, they're well, made they're out of boys the... and girls. Graham, yeah. you're a man of the world. <laughs> we can pop back every week or so and you could give them educational lessons. <laughs> yeah that's possible you could relocate them you could relocate the Slurians there's plenty of opportunities for it to do but yeah you have completed Paradise Lost and restored some measure of Paradise to it um, I left out a couple of the kind of hooks for the later adventures in this book because I wanted you to have a self-contained story and I mm. think that you guys did amazingly well and um there's a, a, a strange thing with this game in that um, there is obviously this big system for running encounters, mm -hmm. and I always play it with people who are so good at role playing that it's kind of hard to put it in, and <laughs> you kind of have to wedge it in a little bit because Doctor Who tends to bring out great role playing people, and you guys were absolutely amazing. It's um, it's it's always good to have it to fall back on. And uh, thanks, thanks for running us through this as well. I think I think that's quite important as well to mention, like the idea that for a lot of people sometimes role playing can be a little intimidating. So having the yeah. ability to roll through with mechanical based stuff is really handy because you can often you know offer up a little bit of a line and then use the dice to dictate where things go and sort of coax things on as the as the GM as well, which is really awesome. So yeah, that was really good fun. Thank you. Awesome. Fantastic mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, if you are interested in playing through some more Doctor Who, uh, then you can check out Cubicle 7's already existing mm -hmm. Doctor Who game. Or if you're into your fifth edition, there it is. Then, uh, <laughs> Doctors and Daleks uh, Watch out is for that, on yeah. its way. Yeah. So you'll be able to pick that up if you're already familiar and uh, hopefully introduce your friends and gaming group to a whole new way of playing uh, Doctor Who across the universe. Until next time, bye bye. We hope you enjoyed this Let's Play. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.